Hello everyone and welcome back to Water Child Tarot. My name is Sarah and thank you for joining me today for this look at the Golden Dawn, the Golden Dawn Tarot, and the Golden Dawn Tarot compared with the Tarot by A.E. Waite and the Tarot by Crowley. So uh, I want to start off this video with um, a quote from this book, Do What Thou Wilt, A Life of Aleister Crowley by Lauren Sutton. Um, I will again uh, repost my bibliography um, in the show notes below. But I want to talk about um, what the Golden Dawn was at first, and I think that uh, Sutton kind of summarizes it um, pretty well. So I'm just going to read you out of this book. One must bear in mind that to be a member of an occult society in Crowley's time was a far different affair than in the, quote, cult consciousness atmosphere of present times. There was then a sense of participating in a grand but hidden tradition that was intertwined with the history of Europe and was now carried on by a daring and enlightened avant-garde. In the 1890s, interest in the occult had reached a peak not only in Britain but also on the continent. Paris had become a center of esoteric activity with a number of self-styled Rosicrucian groups. The inspiration for much of the magic in Paris was Eliphas Lévy, a nom de plume of Alphonse Louis Constant, a one-time candidate for the Catholic priesthood, who, after a struggle of conscience, found truths better suited to his tastes in the Hermetic tradition. Now, the Golden Dawn was in part based on Rosicrucian beliefs and um, got its seeds in the Societas Rosicrucia in Anglia, um, which was started in the 1860s in England. And this information I'm pulling from A.E. Waite, Magician of Many Parts. So the SRIA, this body of, uh, of Rosicrucian practitioners, um, was meeting regularly and gaining in popularity. And then um, the society gained a new member whose inventive genius in the field of occultism was second to none, Dr. William Wynne Westcott. So he was a medical practitioner um, and he was active in Freemasonry um, and, a, and a Kabbalist. So all of these aspects then get pulled into the Golden Dawn. Um, what's interesting about Westcott is that he then decides to found this new society. And in order to do so, this is what this is what the book says. Okay, so it says, being a competent occultist, Westcott accordingly created the creator. At some time during 1887, Westcott had obtained, from what source he never made clear, a series of manuscripts in cipher, which proved upon decoding to be the outlines of the initiatory rituals of an occult order. Also among the manuscripts was the name of a German adept, Fraulein Anna Springle, together with her address in Stuttgart. Westcott promptly wrote to her and in November 1887 received an effusive reply, appointing him to the grade of Adeptus Exemptus and authorizing him to found a new English society of the Golden Dawn. He was further empowered to, quote, choose two learned persons in order to make up the first three masters. And these he duly selected from the Russian Crucian Society members that he was already familiar with. Um, it turns out that uh, historians basically believe that uh, Westcott made up this person, Anna Sprengel. Um, she conveniently dies a few years or a year or two after Westcott gets the Golden Dawn going, and there's no evidence that she ever existed. So those are the dubious seeds of the Golden Dawn. Um, what I will say in a positive light is that the Golden Dawn did accept women at the time, which was um, not the norm. Um, this is a time, again, when women did not have the right to vote in the English government, um, and uh, many societies, um, both sort of uh, traditional, like the Royal Society, um, art colleges, places, uh, places of science and mathematics, did not accept women as members. And so for the Golden Dawn to be open to women from the very beginning um, is, is a positive thing. Um, granted, uh, the three senior members of the Golden Dawn and then later various factions were all founded by men. Um, so I don't know that women necessarily had as much power in the society, but at, at some points uh, during its 
you know, 20 to 30 year run, um, there were more women in the society than men. So the Golden Dawn was basically a secret society, a secret occult society based in Hermeticism. The full title of the, the group is the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, which again is based in Neoplatonism. I've made vague references to this and everything I know about Neoplatonism basically I've learned from Robert Place. So if you want to learn more about Hermeticism in tarot, I can highly recommend his books as well. Um, but the Golden Dawn combined a lot of the things that we're still combining today in terms of um, our, our use of tarot along with things like alchemy and uh, astrology and Christian mysticism and Kabbalah. Now, not all practitioners um, do tarot this way, but it is certainly a popular trend and it heavily influenced Waite and Crowley when they made their decks. So today I wanted to look at these decks in more detail and compare them with um, the original Golden Dawn deck, and that has a big asterisk after it. Um, the problem is that we don't have an extant copy of what the Golden Dawn used for their tarot deck. Now again, they used this for ceremonial magic. They used it for uh, mystical practices that they prescribed. They used it for meditation and contemplation. So they did not use a tarot deck, uh, at least my understanding is they don't, they didn't use the tarot deck in the way that we would use it today um, in terms of laying out tarot cards in order to contemplate any matter that we might want to contemplate. Um, they used it in a very specific ritualist, ritualistic manner. We know a lot about the Golden Dawn because Israel Regardi wrote down um, and published information. And he's also has a hand in creating the Golden Dawn deck that we're gonna take a look at in just a minute. But I wanna point out something else about Regardi before we do that. Um, and again, I'm gonna pull from this book, um, A Magician of Many Parts. It says, in June 1935, Waite worked conscientiously on a report on, quote, Israel Regardie's Golden Dawn Revelations, the introductory volume of which has been submitted for my opinion by George Rutledge and Sons. By the end of the month, quote, on the authority of my reports, end quote, Rutledge had declined the book. Waite did not approve of the publica publication of the Golden Dawn Rituals. Although he toyed with the idea himself in 1937 and writer announced on the dust jacket of the secret T tradition in Freemasonry, another of Waite's books, um, the eminent publication of the secret rituals of the Rosy Cross, i.e. the non-grade ceremonies of the independent and rectified rite, and prided himself on scotching Rigardi's plans in England. In December 1936, he wrote to a former order member to advise him that, quote, there are spurious temples in existence, and as an illustration of the kind of persons whom they include, it may be mentioned that a Jew is attempting to find a publisher in America or here, where he has so far failed, who will risk capital over the publication of all Golden Dawn rituals, knowledge lectures, and so forth. I spoilt his chance here with a big firm, but have no influence with business houses across the Atlantic. Letter of 17 December 1936. So I'm putting that out there because uh, Waite did not approve or, or says he does not approve of um, exposing the Golden Dawn rituals. Um, and I just find it interesting that Israel Regardi is now the person who is um, publishing this deck against, and he was trying to get Waite on board and get his help, but Waite turns him away. So it's just a little interesting moment in sort of tarot history or, or Golden Dawn history. All right, without further ado, we're going to go down onto the desk here and look at some cards. So uh, here are the backs. I'm going to talk about the publication history briefly of each of these decks, and then we'll just get into looking at the pictures. So in the center here, this is the Golden Dawn deck. And um, I want to point out that this deck is now developed from written descriptions of what the deck looked like. We don't have extant copies of this because it was secret and because each member of the Golden Dawn was meant to draw their own version of the deck. And none of those have survived, or at least none of them have turned up to date. So what we have is this deck. Um, and there are other Golden Decks now um, 
in existence, uh, other versions of this, but they're all, to my knowledge, they're all based on these written descriptions of what the cards would have looked like. So this version is called the Golden Dawn Tarot, based upon the esoteric designs of the Secret Order of the Golden Dawn, with instruction booklets published by U.S. Games. And then on the back, we can see that it's credited, so it's illustrated by Robert Wang, or Wang, under the direction of Israel Rigardi. So here's Israel Rigardi, years later, um, kind of, you know, getting his just desserts, I guess you could say. Um, and then it says, based upon the interpretations of S. L. McGregor Mathers, who was with Westcott um, in the Golden Dawn for, for a period of time, he was one of the leaders of the Golden Dawn. And it says for exclusive use by the initiates, by the initiates. So again, this had a very specific, not very general tarot purpose um, when it was originally created back in the 18, whenever it was originally created. I don't know exactly when the Golden Dawn created their version of this deck. So that's what we're going to look at today. We're going to be comparing it with the Roses and Lilies version of the Rider Waite Smith pack. Um, I have the 1909 uh, art restoration deck here. And we're also going to compare it with the Aleister Crowley and Lady Frida Harris Thoth tarot deck. Um, this one is also published by US Games. This is the smaller sort of not really pocket, but slightly smaller than standard tarot card size. I'm sorry I don't have a larger version of the Thoth deck because it would be nice to see the pictures a little bit bigger compared to the others. It has the most complex artwork, but this is this is what I have. So we're going with this one. Um, a little bit more about each of these. So uh, the Golden Dawn tarot does come with a little white booklet and there, I'm not sure if there was ever a larger uh, version of this um, booklet published by US Games, but that's what comes in the box with it. The Crowley Tarot also comes with a little white booklet, and this one's written by James Wasserman. It includes two essays by Lady Frida Harris, and then commentary by Stuart Kaplan. And I, I will say that Stuart Kaplan also contributed to the Golden Dawn booklet as well. And then this particular publication of the writer... Uh, Wade Smith that I have did not come with any little white book, but the normal pack from US Games still comes with a very condensed version of Wade's pictorial key to the tarot. All right, so here we go with the flip through. I am going to give you the keywords and phrases that the Golden Dawn used for their tarot deck, and I just want to see how that resonates across the cards. I'm going to try not to discuss anything. I'll just let you listen, and then you can pause the video, look at the pictures yourself. Um, but for the Major Arcana, we have a, a phrase for each one. We also have phrases for each of the court cards, and then we have sort of a keyword. It's, it's a phrase, but it's more of a keyword for each of the minor cards. So that was really my purpose in making this video, is just looking to see how the Golden Dawn did or did not influence Waite and Crowley's choices of imagery across their decks. Now, Waite made some uh, some modifications to his deck, and then Crowley made a number of modifications, um, uh, particularly in the titles of the cards, which we'll see um, as we go through this. So they're not always necessarily called the same thing, but they do correspond to each other. All right, so this is the Fool, and the phrase for this is the Spirit of the Ether. Next we have the Magician, the Magus of Power. The High Priestess, or the Papess, as she's called um, in this Golden Dawn document. It's interesting that the, um, the US Games deck went with the High Priestess title, because she's called the Papess here in my notes. But at any rate, she is the priestess of the silver star. There's no silver star. There's a moon. <laughs> then we have the empress, the daughter of the mighty ones. The emperor, son of the morning, chief among the mighty. This 
This is also called the Pope in my notes, although here again we have the Stuart Kaplan, the Hierophant. I'm not sure which the Golden Dawn would have preferred. But at any rate, he is the Magus of the, the Eternal. This lover's card in the Golden Dawn is based on a Greek myth. It is not based on either the Garden of Eden scene that we see in Waite's deck or this sort of Marseille-inspired uh, situation over here in Crowley's deck. And for the lovers, we have the Children of the Voice, the Oracle of the Mighty Gods. Seven, the chariot, the child of the powers of the waters, the lord of the triumph of light. We'll see lots of chariots in the Golden Dawn deck as we go through the court cards. Here we have strength. Uh, Crowley calls this lust. And in Crowley's deck, this is at position uh, 11 normally, but I've just moved it to 8 so we can see these side by side. And for strength or fortitude, we have the Daughter of the Flaming Sword. For the Hermit, the Prophet of the Eternal, the Magus of the Voice of Power. For fortune, or the Wheel of Fortune, the Lord of the Forces of Life. Here we have Justice, which Crowley calls Adjustment, and would normally have at position 8, but again, I've moved this just to so we can compare them. This one is called the Daughter of the Lords of Truth, the Ruler of the Balance. I really like this card like a feather cape she's wearing. And of course I like blue, so that's appealing. We have the hanged man, the spirit of the mighty waters. And I also want to uh, point out that Robert Wang, again, was working from verbal descriptions of the cards. He, was, he did not have a deck to go from, so a card like this, you might have something like a man hangs suspended from a stone sea cave opening. Uh, he's held up by his right foot with his leg, left leg crossed behind his right at the knee. Uh, he wears a red unitard and has a triangle behind him with an aura of light or something like that. So it's, it's difficult, I think, to... Um, create images just from verbal descriptions. And I think in some of these uh, cards, we can see like this death card, for example, that the elements don't really have any kind of flow or connection. It's just like, I drew an eagle's head, I drew a flaming snake, I drew a skeleton, I drew some body parts, I drew a thing in the corner, I'm done. So for death, our key phrase is the child of the great transformers, the Lord of the gate of death. Next we have card 14, which Crowley decided to rename as Art instead of Temperance. And this is called The Daughters of the Reconcilers, the Bringer Forth of Life. Here we have the Devil, the Lord of the Gates of Matter, the Child of the Forces of Time. Here we have the Tower, the Lord of the Hosts of the Mighty. And for the Star, we have the Daughter of the firm Firmament, the Dweller Between the Waters. For the moon, the ruler of the flux and reflux, the child of the sons of the mighty. 
a lot of uh, Egyptian imagery going along here. We have the scarab, we have the Anubis-like figures. Here for our sun card, we have the Lord of the Fire of the World. And Crowley incorporates all the signs of the zodiac around the sun card. For our judgment card, or the Eon, as Crowley calls it, we have the Spirit of the Primal Fire. And then the universe, um, the, the Golden Dawn incorporates, I'm assuming this is some kind of uh, Kabbalistic um, color scheme here with the Tree of Life. Um, oh, that's one thing I forgot to point out, actually, is that this deck does come with a Tree of Life card with all the paths numbered on the tree of Kabbalistic Tree of Life. So I'm assuming there's some relationship here with this world card. Uh, it does remind me of chakra system, but um, there's too many, there's too many chakras <laughs> for it to be that. So at any rate, the world card or the universe is called the Great One of the Night of Time, and that's N-I-G-H-T. Right, so now we're going to get into the numbered cards, and here we're going to go aces, and then twos, and then threes, and so forth. So for ace of wands, we have the root of the powers of fire. Our ace of cups represents the root of the powers of water. Ace of Swords, we have the Root of the Powers of Air. And Ace of Pentacles, or Ace of Discs, as Crowley calls his suit, the Root of the Powers of Earth. I also really like this card. So here's where we get into the very sparse pips of the Golden Dawn deck. Um, even the implements are not very large. The, you know, it's supposed to be wands. It's mostly a big cloud and a little hand and a little tiny set of wands. Um, so yeah, not, not my artistic style by any means, but interesting choices here. All right, so for the two of wands, um, all of the, the two through 10 are the Lord of whatever. So I'm just going to give you the keyword or key phrase. So for the two of wands, we have dominion and that is here on the, the keywords on the Thoth deck, but you can see it reflected in, in Waits imagery here, dominion, you know, this is my kingdom. I own the earth and literally have the world in my hand. Or the Two of Cups, Love, and that's what Crowley has put here. For the Two of Swords, we have Peace Restored. Crowley just calls this peace. Two of Pentacles or Discs is Harmonious Change or just Change. So, so far it seems like Crowley is pretty much keeping with these Golden Dawn references. On to our threes, our Three of Wands. Keyword is Established Strength um, and Crowley calls this Virtue. Three of Cups, we get Abundance, and that's what Crowley calls his card as well.
Three of Swords. We have Lord of Sorrow. And Pentacles or Discs is Lord of Material Works. So Crowley just simplifies that to works. On to the fours. We have perfected work for our Golden Dawn key phrase, and Crowley calls this completion. Four of Cups gives us blended pleasure. Uh, Crowley calls this luxury. I can kind of see that here, that you have so much you don't even need anymore. Four of Swords, Rest from Strife, which Crowley calls Truce. And for Pentacles, we have Earthly Power. Again, Crowley simplifies this to just power. I keep saying Crowley. Maybe uh, US Games or somebody else. I don't know who chose the, the keywords that ended up on the published version of this deck. All right, for the Five of Wands, we have Strife. Five of Cups is loss in pleasure. Crowley calls this disappointment. Certainly is the vibe we get from Waits deck as well. Five of Swords, we have defeat. Five of Pentacles, we have material trouble or Crowley calls this worry, which is interesting. Um, this depicts actually bad things happening, but it's the implication here is more that you are worried that this might happen to you, not that it has happened. Disruptive thoughts. That fits with fives for me. All right, so for six, we have six of wands, victory. Six of Cups is Pleasure. So not nostalgia. That's an Eden Grey thing, and I'm going to talk about her at some point too. But pleasure. So simple pleasure, you might say. Like being a child in a garden, having somebody give you a gift. Simple pleasure. Six of cut of sorry, six of swords is earned success. Crowley calls this science, interestingly, um, and I have not read him in depth to know exactly what he means by science, but the Golden Dawn thinks this is earned success. And for our Six of Pentacles, material success. So you have earned so much that you can give some of it away is what I see over here in the weight card. For our sevens, we have Seven of Wands, Valor, and that's what Crowley calls his card. Seven of Cups, Illusionary Success, certainly reflected here. Um, and Crowley goes a different direction. This is debauch, so it's more like overindulgence. Seven of Swords, we have unstable effort. Crowley calls this futility. And that's interesting too. I hadn't thought of the Seven of Swords in that way, but if you think about 
This is one person stealing a few swords from a very large army encampment here. You see these guys are in the background. You know, they could turn around and certainly dispatch him. So it's sort of like trying to fight a one-man fight against a powerful army. For the Seven of Pentacles, we have Success Unfulfilled. Crowley calls this Failure, which is more blunt. Um, I'm not sure I see failure. I see a frown on his face, but his crop is growing. For Eight of Wands, we have Swiftness. Eight of Cups is Abandoned Success. You can see that here. You're walking away from something you've built. Crowley calls this indolence. Eight of Swords. Shortened Force. Crowley calls this Interference. Shortened Force. So like holding back, having force, but not using all of it? Not really sure. Eight of Pentacles or Discs is Prudence. And that is what Crowley calls it. I love this card. Not for the symbolism or whatever Crowley intended, I just like the fuchsia and the orange background and the cool looking flowers. Nine of Wands is our Great Strength card, and Crowley, Crowley calls it Strength. Certainly reflected here, like you've gotten your ass kicked, but you're reinforcing your barrier and you're, you know, you're sticking with your mission here. Nine of Cups. Material happiness. Crowley just calls this happiness. Certainly this guy looks like he's got material success. Nine of Swords, Despair and Cruelty, and again Crowley shortens to Cruelty. So I will talk about uh, how these keywords match up a little bit at the end of this video. And here we have Nine of Pentacles, Material Gain. So Happiness and Gain. For our nines and for our ten oppression so that does more read in the line of burden which is a common keyword used in RWS books uh, and Crowley does use that word oppression here Ten of Cups, we have Perfected Success, and Crowley calls that Satiety. For our Ten of Swords, Ruin, certainly reflected in both the Weight and the Crowley cards. And then the Ten of Pentacles, Wealth. And you can see that both Waite and Crowley incorporated the Kabbalistic Tree of Life in their arrangement of their coins or discs uh, in this card. All right, on to the court cards. Now Crowley rearranged the court cards. So in his deck, it goes Princess, Prince, Queen, Knight. But those are equivalent to page knight, queen, king over here in RWS. So don't get confused. I will be comparing like for like here. 
So our Princess of Wands, her key phrase is the Princess of the Shining Flame, the Rose of the Palace of Fire. For our Princess or Page of Cups, we have the Princess of the Waters, the Lotus of the Palace of the Floods. Our Page of Swords is the Princess of the Rushing Winds, the Lotus of the Palace of Air. And our Page or Princess of Pentacles is the Princess of the Echoing Hills, the Rose of the Palace of Earth. So this is the Lord of the Flame and the Lightning, the King of the Spirits of Fire. And I'll point out that I think all the princes in this Golden Dawn deck are in chariots. So this one's pulled by a lion. Here's the Prince of Cups, a.k.a. the Lord of the Waves and the Waters, the King of the Hosts of the Sea. For our Knight, our Prince of Swords, we have Lord of the Winds and the Breezes, King of the Spirits of Air. And for our Prince or Knight of Pentacles, we have the Lord of the Wild and the Fertile Land, the King of the Spirits of Earth. Then on to our Queens, we have our Queen of Wands, the Queen of the Thrones of Flame, Queen of Cups is the Queen of the Thrones of the Waters. Our Queen of Swords, ooh, doing a good, uh, good job there with your knife. Um, and she is the Queen of the Thrones of Air. Both of these depict a woman who's just cut somebody's head off. And our Queen of Pentacles is the Queen of the Thrones of Earth. Queens get a little short shifted on the uh, flowery names here. We don't get the double title for them. And then finally, our Kings, who are Knights in Crowley's deck. That's the highest rank. So for the King of Wands, we have the Prince of the Chariot of Fire, which now has given me an earworm. Thank you very much. King of Cups is the Prince of the Chariot of the Waters. I guess these guys get short shifted too, so that's all right. They don't have as, as many fancy titles as the lower ranking court cards. Uh, for King of Swords, we have the Prince of the Chariots of the Winds. And finally, our King of Pentacles is the Prince of the Chariot of Earth. I like this card too. So there is our full walkthrough again of the Golden Dawn deck compared with the Rider Waite Smith and the Crowley uh, Harris decks. Um, I just want to point out uh, one other thing, and I'm going to talk about this in more detail. Um, when I talk about sort of my numerological uh, associations and preferences for the numbered cards. But something that I've struggled with as I've been learning tarot over the last couple of years is that this these Golden Dawn based systems of keywords with the, uh, with the numbers 
don't really seem to have any internal internal um, rhyming scheme or uh, consistency in terms of positive or negative associations or even topical associations. So for example, um, in the, the twos, we have dominion, love, peace restored, and harmonious change. So out of those, dominion doesn't seem to fit, the fire suit. Um, love and peace and harmony all seem to go together. Then you get to the three and you get established strength, abundance, sorrow, and works or material work. So again, sorrow is the odd man out in the sword suit. Um, and it kind of goes on from there. Not all of them do it. Sometimes you get two and two. Sometimes you get one odd one and three that are kind of similar. Um, but that's something I've been wrestling with. And granted, I haven't, you know, I haven't studied Crowley's book in depth. I haven't studied the Golden Dawn. So I'm sure they had a lot of reasons um, for doing things the way that they were doing. And again, they were not creating these decks to read tarot with. They were doing it for ceremonial magic purposes and other kinds of uh, hermetical studies and Kabbalistic rituals and all of this. Um, but because there doesn't seem to be any kind of internal structure that, that is predictable, um, it does actually make it awkward <laughs> to just use it as a standalone tarot deck. Um, it makes all three of them kind of awkward in that way. So, and especially the Rider Waite Smith, where you know things have evolved away from the Golden Dawn teachings, and this is now the most popular tarot deck probably in existence, and the most widely uh, written about and taught in terms of you know classes and uh, books that you can buy to kind of learn tarot or learn keywords. So I think I think it's inhibiting because I think for the beginner that wants to be able to understand a pattern or understand a system behind it. Um, just having these keywords that don't seem to uh, repeat in any consistent manner, um, it's it's very off-putting. So um, I'm going to address that. It's something I've been wrestling with, and that'll be a series maybe later this summer um, when we're back from our trip and after I do my giveaway, um, which is coming up, by the way. Subscribe if you haven't. Um, but after I kind of get through that that portion, I have some ideas for doing... Um, sort of my own <laughs> revision and correction of tarot and how I work with keywords with, uh, in particular, with the Rider Waite Smith deck. So I hope you'll look forward to that. So thank you again for joining me for um, this walkthrough. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have not seen the Golden Dawn deck, I hope it was interesting for you just to, to get a look at it. Um, again, it's quite a specialized tool and um, certainly not one that I use. So I, I'm not trying to suggest that you would need any, any of these decks that I've shown you today in particular. Um, but of course, if you are going to study their system um, or if you're going to look into some of their broader teacher, teachings on occultism, uh, you may want to get a copy. And all three of these are available and in print as far as I know. So um, that is the good news. So thank you again for joining me. I will sign off now and I will see you again very soon. Take care.